ओम नमो भगवते वासुदेवा नारायण नमस्कृत नरम चरोतम देवी सरस्वती व्यास तथो जाया मुदीरहे नष्ट प्रायेशु अभद्रेशु नित्यम भागवत सेवया भागवती उत्तमा श्लोके भक्तिर भवती नैष्ट की कृष्णाय वासुदेवाय देवकी नंदनाय च नंद गोपकुमाराय गोविंदय नमो नम श्रीमद भागवतम कैन टू टेन चैप्टर ट्वेंटी सेवन टेक्स्ट नंबर टेन नमस् तोभ्यम भगवते पुषया महात्मने वासुदेवाय कृष्णाय सात पतये नमः नमस्तुभ्यम भगवते नमस्तुभ्यम भगवते पुषया महात्मने वासुदेवाय कृष्णाय वासुदेवाय कृष्णाय सात पतये नमः नमस्तुभ्यम भगवते पुषा महात्मने वासुदेवाय कृष्णाय सात पतये नमः नमस्तुभ्यम भगवते पुषया महात्मने वासुदेवाय कृष्णाय सात पतये नमः महात्मने वासुदेवाय नमः अबेसेंसेस तुभ्यम अंटू यू 
Bhagavate, the Supreme Personality of Godhead. Purushaya, the Lord dwelling within the hearts of all. Maha Atmane, the great soul. Vasudevaya, to him who dwells everywhere. Krishnaya, Shri Krishna, Satvatam of the Yadu dynasty. Pataye, to the master. Namaha, obeisances. Translation. Obeisances unto you, the Supreme Personality of Godhead, the great soul, who are all pervading and who reside in the hearts of all. My obeisances unto you, Krishna, the chief of the Yadu dynasty. Text 11. Translation. Unto him who assumes transcendental bodies according to the desire of his devotees. Unto him whose form is itself pure consciousness. Unto him who is everything, who is the seed of everything, and who is the soul of all, of all creatures, I offer my obeisances. Purport. We could hardly conjure from the first line of this verse that God is somehow impersonal but assumes a personal material body. It is clearly said here that the Lord assumes different forms according to Swachanda according to his own desire or according to desire of his devotees. An impersonal God could hardly reciprocate with the personal desire of its devotees, nor could an impersonal God itself have desires, since desire is characteristic of personality. Therefore, the Lord's manifesting different forms in a personal way, responding to personal desires, indicates that he is eternally a person and manifests his different transcendental bodies as an expression of his own eternal nature. The word Vas Visuddha Jnana Murtaye is most significant. Murti means the form of the deity, and it specifically states here the Lord's form is itself completely pure consciousness. Consciousness is the primary spiritual element distinct from any of the material elements and even distinct from the subtle or psychological material elements, mundane mind, intelligence and false ego, which are simply a psychic covering over, power, over pure consciousness. Since the Lord's form is made of pure consciousness, it can hardly be understood as a material body like the mortal bags of flesh and bones we carry around in this world. In the last two lines of this verse, there is a poetic emphasis on the word Sarva, everything. The Lord is everything. He is the seed of everything and He is the soul of every creature. Therefore, let us join with Indra in offering our obeisances to the Lord. Om Timirandhasya Gyananjana Shalakaya Chakshurun Militam Yena Tasmai Sri Guru Namaha Sri Chaitanya Mano Bhistam Stapitam Yena Bhutale Swayam Rupa Kadamayam Dadati Swapadantikam Nama Om Vishnu Padaya Krishna Prestaya Bhutale Sri Mate Bhakti Vedanta Swami Iti Namine Namaste Saraswati Deve Gauravani Pracharine Nirvishesha Shunyavadi Paschatya Deshatarine Namo Mahavadanyaya Krishna Prema Pradayate Krishnaya Krishna Chaitanya Namine Gauratvise Namaha he Krishna Karuna Sindhu Dina Bandhu Jagatpate Gopesha Gopika Kanta Radha Kanta Namostute 
ताप्त कांचन गौरांगी राधे वृंदावनेश्वरी वृषभानु सुते देवी प्रणमा हरि प्रिय वाचाकूभ्य कृपा सिंधुभ्य पतिता पावनेभ्यो वैष्णवेभ्यो नमो नम जय श्री कृष्ण चैतन्य प्रभु निनंद श्रीअद्वैत गदाधार श्रीवास आदि गौर भक्तवृंद हरे कृष्णा हरे कृष्णा 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 हरे 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 राम हरे राम 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 हरे 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 कृष्णा सो इट्स इंडीड अ ग्रेट 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 प्रिविलेज टू हैव द opportunity to read this beautiful chapters of the shrimad bhagavatam especially the 10th canto of shrimad bhagavatam by krishna's mercy and prabhu's mercy we have survived <laughs> the long journey through the pages of bhagavatam and we have reached this beautiful forest of grace as we call it in the 10th canto of bhagavatam which is nothing but forest of grace the darshan into the forest of grace forest of mercy forest of pure divinity and in in this tent canto one of the most astounding and most beautiful chapters is obviously the govardhan leela and uh, through this govardhan pastime uh, so many amazing gifts have been given to the lo- to the world uh, of course we have our own deity here <laughs> gopal ji lifting the giriraj parvat it's because of this beautiful pastime that we have this beautiful form of the lord and so many very interesting and amazing places on the parikrama of govardhan are outcome of this past time of smashing the pride of indra and surbi and indra approaching to the lord offering prayers the places like govindakund surbi kund eravat kund naval afsara kund and all this astounding beautiful places which are still visible to this mortal eyes many of the places are looked are lost to the eyes but they are still visible to us indeed when we go there we can take complete shelter of these places because these places are filled with this powerful vibrations so how much wonderful it is for all of us to really have these places especially places like govindakund just sitting there you can you can imagine this beautiful pastime has happened there surabhi kund the place this particular verse at this particular episode right happened there so it is it is indeed a very very wonderful <coughs> uh past time that has been happening and uh, while we are reading the bhagavatam and while we have been reading verse by verse uh, progression of this past time we are in this very very important uh, situation where indra devendra for the last few verses is offering his prayers to krishna many times because of the obvious shallowness of devotion that we may be having in our hearts very shallow uh it becomes very very natural or rather it becomes very very uh like a habit to imitate the great souls because as we also say that if you can't make it fake it <laughs> so you know we 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 extend this a bit to too long and we keep on faking it and the result is we never make it so similarly in in our observation we have seen that the brijbasi is the most elevated devotees of the lord even the current brijbasis who are staying in vrindavan uh, they have a typical way of addressing indra 
Indra, you know, because you know he did something to Krishna, he did something to the bridge Basis, and they, they they very much address him as a very ordinary person. Okay, oh Indra, what is this? Oh Indra, you know, is is like in one of those ordinary guys in one of the corners. That's the way they talk, and we have no right to judge how they can talk the way they talk. But do we have the etiquette? Do we have the qualification? Do we have the kya mari okad hai? Do we have the 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 capacity to talk about Indra in any way other than out of utmost respect? But we do so sometimes. We just oh that Indra, you know, when it starts raining, hey Indra, stop the rain. So who are we to do that? Many times we just say, hey Indra, hey, kya Indra, don't, don't trouble us. I mean, so I was trying to just understand, who is Indra? And once you understand who is Indra, keeping Indra as a reference point, you can easily understand who is Krishna. To the, to the extent we do not understand the glory of Indra, to that extent whether we like it or not, whether we accept it or not, whether we know it or not, we may not be able to appreciate the glory of Krishna. And we may be taking Krishna very casually, as the bridge buses take Krishna as very casually. Oh, Juta Kaiga. Huh? The Dibauji. Yeah, but Radharani can speak that. And of course, it is part of our Sikshastakam. But can we see Krishna as like that? For us it is Ishwara Parama Krishna Sachitananda Vigraha Anadira Adira Govinda Sarva Karana Karanam. That's the way our original Acharya, Lord Brahma, addressed Krishna. In none of the Brahma Samhita you see Krishna is a liar. <laughs> Krishna is a debauchi. Krishna is, he, you know, he doesn't keep his words. There's beautiful glorification of the glory of Krishna. So while we are in, in, in this portion, for some time we must understand what is the glory of Krishna and we may, I mean, what is the glory of Indra and we may not be able to understand the glory of Indra just as much as a frog understands the extent of the ocean. When I first became a devotee, uh, the first book I was given is the laws, uh, what is that? Uh, the scientific business of Krishna consciousness. E is equal to MC square by the BI. The first book... <laughs> Because all the people who preached to me were from the BI, my brother, including my brother. So then, you know, then I opened the first page, I distinctly remember, I opened the first page and I saw this, this, pa- this painting or drawing of a frog. Ah, ah. And then there is this comic character. Ah. How big is the ocean? And then he's saying, this big? Then next photo, this big? Next photo, this big? So it gave me a very graphic understanding what a brilliant painting is that. You know, if you go deep, if you go real deep, this example of frog is so very applicable to us in every aspect of, of spirituality that we are trying to understand. How great is Krishna? Is he this great? This great? This great? Because we will always understand the glory of something based on our yardsticks, based on our measuring instruments. We may never understand some, something beyond this, this or this. Right? So as this frog mentality that we may have, we may never understand the glory of Indra. What to talk of Krishna? Hmm? I was just thinking, Indra, we talk about education. Hmm? We talk about people who are highly educated and practically the, the, the educated people are actually controlling the world. Prabhupada, you know how much emphasis he was to preach to the scientist community. He had the whole BI set up so that he could preach to the scientist community because this intelligentsia of the world are practically controlling the world. Talk about education in the top universities, you know, people, what sort of salaries they are paid. But to be the direct disciple of Brihaspati, I mean, that's really a great education. And Indra was a direct disciple of Brihaspati. So much so has Bhishma Dev or other people. Now to be 
a disciple and have the qualification to learn under brihaspati it's a very very great honor a great position indeed we talk about beauty uh, i mean you know uh, if 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 some man is beautiful you know, you know some woman will fall on i mean would, would be wanting to sp- spend time with him and everything in some marriage that i heard recently you know you just call one of this uh, this uh, this bollywood actresses to come in the marriage and perform just performing for 15 minutes they charge you a crore rupees that close to 250000 dollars uh, just to perform and and you know because they apparently are looking very beautiful and they they they, they have these features they have their charms they have their figures and that's why they get, they paid they get paid this sort of amounts hmm? but can you imagine the beauty of indra and the power of indra that that all the apsaras who were millions of time more beautiful than any of the most beautiful miss universes that we would have in this world in the past or in the future these apsaras are are servants of indra indra is maintaining them can you imagine how powerful and how i mean they dance for him free of cost is not the indra has to give up a check every now and then for their dance that's how beautiful indra is charming personality opulence <laughs> i mean you know we talk about opulence how can we i mean i, I just uh, you know we have been talking about buying houses you know so at the most my mind can stretch to 2 bhk 3 bhk or a 4 bedroom house kitchen and and that's oh somebody buying a house is great so our yastik is having a big house but what is the opulence of indra the whole heavenly planet is his home and the opulence that we have heard about hmm? wealth and strength i mean we 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 know all these things how famous is indra just uh, recently a ordinary uh, you know a cricketer who res- resigned from the much awaited resignation <laughs> from his cricket playing career huh? when he was playing his last match this this person had 3.5 million people hooked on to the television to see him resign many of them were resigning to make sure that he does resign and many of them were seeing out of but he is famous but this is a ordinary person having some opulence of some some act of you know as as we say hitting the a ball with a stick but what is the opulence of indra and what is the fame of indra amazing so so while we are just understanding the whole past time let us imagine this great opulent personality and even shukdev goswami writes that indra is offering obeisances with his helmet is putting it down the helmet is as brilliant like the sun okay many times we just read it and most of the time at least i i feel this is all of this is simply a big exaggeration and that's why we don't get impressed by it because if you think it is exaggeration how will you get impressed by something like that but this is not exaggeration it is a fact when sukhdev goswami is saying that indra's crown was as brilliant as the sun can we all understand what must be the opulence of indra and now imagine the situation i was hearing the lecture of burijan prabhu and he was taking us on a on a mental tour of what is exactly happening let us imagine this beautiful towering personality of indra with a beautiful effulgent crown effulgent vakshasthal if effulgent you know what is it called chest i mean not chest armor huh? and effulgent clothes and everything he is coming down on one side is all effulgent powerful great and here is a simple covered boy in a simple environment surrounded by simple looking people in a simple way he is just standing in a simple way see the paradox it is not easy for indra to do what he is doing 
So while we just say, oh Indra, I mean, he, you know, he had to surrender, he had to smash, Krishna smashed his pride. Now, that is good, yeah, he did smash his pride. But that's from Krishna's perspective that he's, that I smashed Indra's pride. But as far as we are concerned, at least the way I see th- things, is that it is simply an amazing act, amazing, a glorious act of Indra, to be on his position of Indra and take such a humble position as this to be read in the pages of Srimad Bhagavatam, a person of this caliber putting his crown down and offering obeisances to an ordinary coward boy. Please see it as a from the humanistic point of view and don't see it from a divinity point of view. Divinity, yes, it is fine. Krishna is divine. He is great. But see from a humanistic point, a great demigod offering respects to an ordinary boy, of course he realized he is not ordinary, but to be for rest of eternity being seen as completely subservient and see the, see the amount of opulence, see the amount of charisma that this personality has, Indra. So when, when we read this, when, when we read this Indra offering obeisance to, to, to Krishna, it definitely shows the glory of Krishna, but it equally shows the glory of Indra for, for, for what he is doing. I was just trying to understand how difficult, just think in your own hearts, how difficult and how much of a tapasya it is to seek apology from anybody. It is, you know, just think you have done some, you, you hurt somebody, and you realize that you are hurt. Is it easy? Is it easy to ask for apologies? It is the most difficult thing to do in life. And to the extent we have this big, big ego, born out of big, big position, to that extent it is that much difficult. But see the glory of this Indra. It is not, it is, it is said, to err is human, to forgive is divine. Right? To err is human. So it is simply human to err. And in that, in this case it is to err is demigod. I mean even demigods do errors. They are not human beings but they are demigods. To err is demigods but to forgive is Krishna. It is divinity. It is divine. So even Indra does mistakes and all of us will do mistakes because to err is human. To err is, even demigods do mistakes. But what is glorious, what really separates what we call dud ka dud, pani ka pani, what separates the genuine guys from the insincere people, is what do they do after they realize that they have done a mistake. That's most important. Because to do mistake, as the saying says, and as we all have experienced, to err is human. Everybody does, does errors, everybody does mistakes. But what we do after we have done the mistake is very, very important. Do we justify our mistakes? Do we try to cover it up? Is it too much difficult to ask for apologies? To that extent, we have a bit fat ego. But just see the case of Indra. He has done a big, blatant mistake. No doubt about that. For seven days, you know, he did something very, very seriously wrong. But as soon as he realized his mistake, he has the utmost humility to approach an ordinary cow and say, please mother cow, come with me, I can't go alone. And he has the humility to approach Krishna in a most humble way and offering this beautiful prayers to Krishna. And in the next, in the next few minutes, we'll be discussing to some extent about this important aspect of Seeking apology. But before that, there is another interesting point that has been made by Indra. And which again shows the great personality of Krishna. Hmm? One, of, one of the aspects that happens in Bhagavatam is that you know, we are drawing Krishna's personality or we are understanding Krishna's personality by each and every words. Hmm? Like somebody says there is somebody who is, a, who is a painter and you say that you, know, you paint somebody with lotus eyes. And then he starts painting with those who are expert. You have not seen the person. Just by description, and you start painting. And somebody with, with this type of lips, somebody with this type of hair. And then he starts painting. And then while the description is going on, in due course, he, he, he makes a beautiful painting of that person. Right? So what are we doing? By the end of the Bhagavatam, what we should be having ready in our hearts is a beautiful chitra or painting 
of Krishna's personality. What is this person? It's such a deep personality that Krishna is. And Sukhdev Goswami, through these wonderful devotees, he's painting various aspects of Krishna's personality. And he's saying here, Swachandar Pita Dehaya Vishuddha Jnana Murtaye. It said that unto him who assumes transcendental bodies, according to the desires of his devotees. Hmm? Very interesting point. That Krishna, one of his personality, that he goes out of his way to fulfill the desires of his devotees. Hmm? Now, he said, oh, so what? Krishna goes out of his way, fine, but... Is let us see, is it easy to go out of the way to fulfill somebody? Because we all are just so busy fulfilling our own desires, isn't it? But Krishna sees life. He's simply wanting to fulfill the desires of his devotees. And this is very, very evident from the Mahaprakash Leela. Hmm? Krishna wanted that devotees appreciate him 100%. Not 95 percent, not 98 percent. They 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 appreciate him 100 percent, and he expects devotees to work hard for that. And at the same time, Krishna also works hard to help devotees appreciate him 100 percent. And how is it? When Murari Gupta stood came in front of Chaitanya Mahaprabhu, he immediately took the form of Ram. Because he knew it. That for Murari Gupta to really appreciate me and really appreciate this whole environment of the Shatapraha, I mean this, this, what is it? Shatapraha Leela, is it right? Uh, what do it is? Uh, the Mahaprakash Leela. For him to really appreciate it, I cannot be Chaitanya, I cannot be Krishna. I can be and he will love me. But when I am Ram, his heart will be drawn for me. And then he will see himself as Hanuman. So Krishna took the form huh, of Ram. I'm sorry, Chaitanya took the form of Ram. And, and he said, Murari, you are Hanuman. And see, you have a tail. And he had a tail. Huh? And then we have this beautiful painting here. This painting of uh, Sukalambar Brahmachari, right? Or Kolavai Sridhar. Kolavai Sridhar. Uh, Kauru Vashidhar was constantly meditating upon the pastimes of, of Krishna Balram and then to, to Sukalam Brahmachari he showed the form of Radha Krishna. So like that, nursing the nursing pastimes. So Krishna incarnates in a f- different different forms just to satisfy the Lord's div- desire, the devotee's desires. And I was hearing the class of Bhakti Rasamrit Maharaj the other day and he was saying that, isn't it amazing that Krishna took the form of a boar, of a fish. What is a fish? Practically, it's an ordinary creature, fish. A boar. You know, just the nose. I mean, in Vrindavan, they, they, they're really they're active, boars. And the nose. And you know, just go deep, deep, deep. And you know, they're just, uh, this whole nose is constantly twitching, 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 twitching. But, you know, for that activity, Krishna took a form for bore just because he had to do that activity to please his devotees. Krishna takes the form of, of Varadev. And that's why it is not some, some, some time pass happening when Jaydev Goswami, a great Goswami, writes the Dash Avatar Stotram, glorifying the ten main incarnations of the Lord because it glorifies Krishna because he is taking all these forms just to please his devotees. Meena Sharira, Shukara Rupa, Kurma Rupa, Rama Sharira, Haladar Rupa, Buddha Sharira, Jai Jagadish Hare. So that Jagadish, Jagadish, the, the, the Adish of all Jagat, the supreme control of the whole creation, he is taking the form based on the devotee's desire. <clears throat> So Indra finds this so amazing, and and you know and and the Brijabasis wanted to see him as a beautiful boy. 
And so he was a beautiful boy for them. The darling of Mother Eshoda, the paramour of Shibadi Radharani. And he was that person if I were Kamsa. <laughs> he takes this form just to please his devotees. Isn't it a wonderful aspect of Krishna's personality that how much effort he takes to please his devotees? That is one very special aspect. If we have faith, if we have understanding that yes, Krishna is such an amazing God that He is ready to do anything to help us to remember Him. That will be a great uh, uh, sustenance for our own spiritual life. That conviction that what a personality Krishna is. So why we are reading Bhagavatam, it should constantly nourish our faith in Krishna. We should be constantly checking, is my faith in Krishna really, really increasing? And that faith will not increase till the time we properly, mentally, intellectually, and spiritually understand the glory of Krishna. Many a times it is simply a mental understanding. We really don't go deep. But how glorious is Krishna? When Indra is making a prayer, try to understand, he's a disciple of Brihaspati, the guru of all the demigods making the prayer. It is not just, you know, whatever came out, he, he spoke. And he was in, in utmost desperation. Please understand, what was the desperation of Indra? He had really messed up right now. <laughs> and in that mess up situation, he had practically zero ego. I mean, not practically, zero ego. And what is coming out is uh, prayers out of intense desperation for Krishna to please Him so that He he forgives Him. So these prayers are intense prayers of desperation from the Lord, for the Lord. Just as much as Draupadi prayed to Krishna, as much as Gajendra prayed to Krishna, same are the prayers of Indra. So it is is a very, very uh, special uh, aspect of Krishna's personality, of how he takes different different forms, and similarly, he takes the form of the holy name, just to be accessible to every single living entity in the world. Just imagine if Krishna was not his holy name, that Krishna was Binna. Binna then his holy name. How many people could worship the deities? If Krishna was only the deity and Bhagavatam, but not the holy name. He could have decided, well, I am everything but the holy name. You can chant my name, but I am not, I am different. Luckily he is, but just imagine if he was not. But just to be accessible to every single person, Krishna said, I do not want any excuses to to, to, to not remember me. You are a chandala, you are a mlecha, you are anybody. You know, the other day I was, I, 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 I do these morning walks. And we go, we go to, there's a large garden. And there are all sorts of trees. And there are many, many tulsi plants planted in there. So I, I was just, I was saying that, you know, if Krishna is so kind, that in amongst the trees he has planted tulsi, and the power of tulsi, you know, is brahmahatya, I mean, if you have done brahmahatya, you pradakshina pade pade, you, you are nullified. So I said, you know, I, I, I mean, in, in a garden in the morning, there are many people who come for their health. There are many you know, boys and girls doing crazy things, and while they're walking, they do all those crazy things. But they're walking around. <laughs> and unknowingly, I mean, just see the Krishna's mercy, they're doing pradakshina of Tulsi. So one person was walking, it was a heavy. He was really heavy, he was perspiring heavily and he was walking. And I, I usually walk and I chant. Not necessarily the, my prescribed rounds, extra rounds, don't worry. So I was chanting and this person came walking. <laughs> what are you doing? <laughs> then I said, you either you have to slow down, I can't run with you. So he slowed down. I said, what are you doing? I see you every day we are just in this beep, beep. Then I was explaining about, uh, about, about chanting. I was walking around and I was explaining about chanting. I said, my dear friend, can you, can you, I said, no, this all, I can't do all these things. I said, I'm not telling you to do it. But can I tell you to do one thing? I said, while you're walking with me, hmm, just repeat what I'm saying. I said, okay, that I can do. 
So while I was walking with him, he said, Vrindaya Tulsi Devaya Priyaya Keshava. So he was saying, Krishna Bhakti Pradedevi Satyavati Namo Nama. So he said that, I said, just write, he said, can you write for me? He said, you just, when you come to the garden, just three times recite this and I said, the magic will happen. Huh? And, and I just realized that how accessible is Krishna? How accessible is Krishna's mercy? Because he's all there for his devotees. And who is his devotees? It's, it's written, desires of his devotees. Who is his devotee? In one sense, everybody. Everybody is his devotee. So Krishna is fulfilling the desires of everybody since time immemorial. And that's the wonderful personality of Krishna. And he is so successful in doing so. So this is a great, great uh, personality that Indra Dev is, is pointing out of Krishna's personality. And uh, while we are talking about Indra, we, we talk about this act that he is doing right now, the act of seeking apology. That I am sorry. Now, you know, it is, it is, uh, in one sense, you say this sorry is such a useless word. Uh, you just do something nasty. I'm sorry. You can't do anything back to that person because he has said sorry. But in one sense, this act of apology is such a deep thing. Especially in cultured society. In society of cultured people. So it is, it, it, so we will discuss about some aspect. I was just trying to analyze what apology is. So first is, when should we ask for apology? The million dollar question is, when should I ask for apology? So many times we, we feel, uh, most of the time we are convinced that we have not done anything, anything wrong. So first of all, to convince ourselves that we have done something wrong to somebody, it's that, it's, it's a task. But the best time to ask for apology is to, re, to, to do it the moment you realize you have done something wrong. The moment you have done something wrong, you should ask for apology. And that's exactly what Indra is doing if you analyze it. Though he realized it. He didn't analyze it. Oh, oh, what should I do now? He said, oh my God, what have I done? And he just immediately got to the job for seeking apology. So the best time to seek apology is to realize, as soon as you, re, you realize that you've done a mistake. Many times we feel this is obvious, obviously this is obvious, that you should ask for apology when you realize it mistake. But that's true when somebody has done a mistake towards you. But when, when you have done a mistake, what do you do? I was analyzing that you are usually protecting yourself from the shame and you're waiting for the heat to go over. We said that I don't I, I ask for apology now because let the heat get over, you know, and maybe he will he will not be so upset. I may not have to ask for apology. So we try to delay the process of seeking apology many times, isn't it? We we delay it and we try to postpone it and we even try to avoid it by lying or blaming others. But what but when we really do is what that when we say sorry, it's almost certain. The moment we realize that I can't ask for apology, that's the time we should ask for apology. So that's very, very important. That we should not really wait, should not really try to justify, not try to really cover up. And many a times, as, as we're seeing, many times, <clears throat> uh, you know, many people have this habit of seeking apology for mistakes that they have not done. You know, I'm sorry, I'm sorry, I'm sorry. They're trying to create a false humility. If you see sometimes, no, Prabhuji, I'm sorry, you know, I, I'm sorry. But you have not done that mistake. It's, it's, it's important to be honest. And what happens in, if you see this, that by this kind of pseudo-apology, we may ease the awkward situation of conversation, but it creates a form of a wrong crying of a wolf. Sometimes as we, I was analyzing that, you know, we have this story of that one boy shouted, there's a wolf, there's a wolf. And there was no wolf. People said, this guy is joking. He did it twice. And this guy, when there was actually a wolf, nobody took him seriously. So many times when we ask for apology, when there is no mistake done, 
पीपल से तो ऐसे पूछते रहते हैं सॉरी बोलते रहते एक्चुअली सॉरी अरे आई एम रियली सॉरी अरे तो ऐसे बोलते रहते हैं डन रियली मीन इट आर यू गेटिंग इट Uh, we have seen many times people simply ask for apology when there is no reason for asking. So this pseudo apology is also wrong. So it's not a right time to always ask for apology. <laughs> many times we ask for apology all the time. I'm sorry, Prabhuji. And typically, you know, we show a garb of humility, but inside we are burning to hell with you, rascal. But hey, Prabhuji, I'm sorry. That's hypocrisy, my dear friends. We are trying to cover up our hypocrisy by pseudo apology. Very dangerous. It is like it's, it's like a pondrak like facade that we have. A pondrak was a he simply had a facade of Krishna. Similarly, we have a facade of of humility, apology. But we are actually trying to hide is our disgust. And when we really need it, nobody will take it seriously. The second is how do we ask for apology? You know, many times we say, "I am sorry." <laughs> I am sorry. Huh? Is that all? Huh? There is no, uh, I mean, there is no uh, substance inside. Simply, take it, take it. Sorry. Hmm? I mean, we, we see on the on the roads. First of all, I mean, I was just so convinced. It's so difficult to ask for apology. Somebody has banged in your car, and there's a huge dent in your car, and he knows he has done it. He comes out, kya hai? Just I mean, they, they just see how apology is so much gone from the society because this humility is gone. When he comes, this guy has banged your car or had done something really wrong. It is his mistake, hundred percent. He comes out. And he says, "Kya kar lega? What will you do?" He has, he has no, is no humility at all. Forget saying sorry. I mean, I mean in a very superficial way. But even that is so difficult. Please understand, it is so very difficult to ask sorry. I was so convinced, and when I much more, I could appreciate this because when I saw Indra doing it, it's just so glorious. Because for us, it is just so difficult to say sorry in this world. You you know sometimes you tell you tell a you know tell a even a boy a young boy or a young child you go and tell sorry no tell sorry no I don't want to tell sorry I'll do anything but not tell sorry this is this is Duryodhan syndrome Duryodhan was like that I've been seeing Mahabharat so I'm just affected by Duryodhan <laughs> huh? he, he had this mentality he was just so obstinate and so stubborn say I will do anything but not say sorry to anybody. Because it's just so much humiliating to say sorry, my dear friend. I'm sorry. Just not in our culture. You might say please. It is easier to say please. I was analyzing that there might be a culture of saying please do this, because you know you you are not so much humble by you say please. But you, by you say sorry, that means you accept your mistake. You are fallen, and you are saying sorry to that person. Very difficult. So, how do you say sorry? First of all, the first aspect, the first component of apology is full acknowledgement of the offense. That's you see, it's scientific. The way Indra is doing, I was just trying to analyze the whole process, and you can see it is such a fantastic scientific, spiritually scientific process. It's not some, it's not some emotions just coming out. It is a proper process. That has been followed. Not that Indra was following a process as Brace told, do this, this, this. No, it was his heart, but his heart was following a process. It's a first full acknowledgement of the offenses. That means to accept complete responsibility. Yes, I did it. How many of us can do that when there is a mistake to go to the person whom, whom we offended? My dear friend, my dear wife. Difficult, <laughs> my dear husband. I'm sorry, I did it. It was my mistake. Uh, it doesn't matter whether you and your person you are hurt have the same ethics. Many times we say, you know, we share the same ethics, we have the same relationship. I don't have to really acknowledge that I did it, but it's important to accept. Responsibility of the mistake, and, and we from this we have two brilliant examples in our shastras, Parishit Maharaj and Jiva Goswami. 
these two great powerful acharyas prachit maharaj he was cursed he accepted responsibility yes i did this mistake i did put a dead snake over the shoulder of shamik rishi he accepted the mistake jiva goswami both the people's intentions were not wrong please understand they could have easily justified that's what we do most of the time we justify our wrong doing but which i did this because 1 2 3 4 5 i did this because 3 4 6 7 8 different reasons jiva goswami could have justified rupa goswami my dear uncle i did this to protect you i did it to protect your to to, to protect your glory i knew you are most scholar this is regarding to the story of what is the vallabh bhat is that right vallabh bhat that he was sent to go rubnar no no some some, some vallabh i don't know some what is it scholar na no? in brindavan rupa goswami said i accept the defeat and jiva goswami debated with him hmm? rup narayan i'm not sure so anyway so this this scholar came and jiva goswami he said how can you be having any pride in vrindavan get out of vrindavan so he accept responsibility fine i was displeased he went to a crocodile hole on the banks of jamuna and he, he stayed there doing intense tapasya parikshit maharaj accepted complete responsibility didn't defend didn't didn't counteract I done a mistake. I accept responsibility and move forward. Hmm? The first component of uh, apology is to fully acknowledge our our offenses, to take complete responsibility of our offenses. Second is to give a proper explanation. A truthful explanation is the best shot at rebuilding a peaceful relationship. Hmm? Keep it simple. and while you are giving explanation please understand this act of apology is such a uh, a blow to maya because maya doesn't want maya wants quarrel please understand this age is a quarrel of hypocrisy and the last thing she wants is people asking for apology and creating relationships because apology creates relationships and she wants quarrel so she is not going to give when you starting to ask for apology she she is not going to allow you okay my dear friend continue asking for apology she is going to be Harm, you know, interfering every second. So while you are explaining, sometimes this is my personal ex- experience. While we are explaining things, our ego still comes up. Hey, what are you doing? Shh. And then you start explaining, and you say, after all, you know, it was not so much of a mistake. And again, you are not taking complete responsibility of me. You you did take the uh, responsibility in the first tense, but while you started explain it, you again tell. After all, it is not that bad. You know, I didn't. You know, to be honest, my dear Prabhu. i didn't do it so bad it was not so bad after all so when you explaining be sure that this whole explanation is simply for building the relationship and not for dissecting the event the explanation is not just to again dissect you did this and that's why i did that and that's why you did this moment you start dissecting the whole process of apology is again finished it will not lead to any positive result the second thing is while you explaining something Hmm? You 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 try to explain in such a way that you are not trying to justify of, of of what you are doing, and the main focus of explanation is simply to regenerate the lost relationship because of the offense done, and that's what Indra is doing. Please please see this. He is not saying, you know, after all, Krishna, you know, uh, you know, after, you know, for so many years they offered the 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 yagya to me. how can i not you know how can i uh, accept that you do the yoga and you after all appear in a small child's form if you showed me your virat roop i would have not done this <laughs> he didn't do anything of this sort he explained and he said i take complete responsibility and he explained the whole thing without any justification and then third is genuine expression of remorse the third aspect of apology is genuinity and how do we show genuine expression of remorse i said i am sorry you feel that way you know you know while we are while we when you are genuine we can always ask that i really feel sorry the way you are feeling there should be some genuinity because the moment you speak something from a genuine heart it is easy to 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 discriminate between genuinity and falsity 
He said, I'm really sorry. I know I've pained you. It's not easy to say that by the way. Again. That I know how much you are troubled. And because we have caused trouble to, pe- to people and we genuinely express that yes, I'm aware of it. And, the, and, and part of it is, please tell me what more I can do to please you. So a further uh, way to, to solve the damage is a question that what else can I do to please you? Genuinely. That, you know, I've displeased you, but I, I, I need to do something more. And that's exactly what Keshav Kashmiri did. I was analyzing. He said, Mahapu, I, I, I couldn't understand you. Now please tell me, what should I do? I said, don't tell anybody this. Continue your, this, your service. So he asked for, he said, what more can I do? Because I'm feeling so very bad to, for what I've done. There's another thing. The right, genuine way of asking people that I understand how bad you feel. Please tell me, I am sorry for it. But just saying sorry will, is not just enough. So what more I can do? And then, it's very important, that after apologizing, many times we feel that now that I apologized, we feel it is our right to be forgiven. Right? Is it not? I have done, I, with all my genuinity, and all my conviction, I will ask for apology. Now, Prabhuji, you must forgive. But the last part of apology is to release the victim from any expectation of forgiveness. This is what Adhanath Swami says. That you ask for apology, but to release the victim, that means to release the person who asks for, for, for apology, that you don't have to necessarily forgive me. You release him. Fine, I have done my bit, but you may forgive me, or you may not forgive me. Because even you have an expectation of getting forgiven, mentally, or maybe in due course, verbally, you might, you might do offense further. They ask for apology, you didn't forgive. What sort of person are you? So the complete process of apology is to release the victim or release the person from the expectation of forgiveness. So no matter how noble you have been, this is what I heard from Radhana Swami Maharaj. He said, no matter how noble you have been, he will forgive or refuse to forgive on his own terms. That's his right. What a brilliant point. Hmm? <laughs> you have done the whole process. Now Krishna, lucky for Indra, he forgave him. Because he said, I don't want to forgive. As, as, as you, you did all the things. You put your crown down. You came, all the, all the snan you gave me and everything. Fine, but I don't want to forgive. I'm, it's just too gross example. But you know, many times in our relationships, because we have hurt somebody so intensely, it takes a long time to be forgiven. And we expect to be forgiven immediately. That you know, It's like a mechanical process. You did this and you expect the result. It's not machine. You are dealing with people's hearts. But what you are talking about apology and relationship building is all a matter of hearts. It's not some machine that you do this process and this process will be happen after that. Hmm? So we have to release the victim from the expectation of forgiveness. You, you, you may be as noble as you have been, but it is the right of the person to forgive or not. And But you carry on with your life. And you don't live under the burden of the offense. You have done your best. But you can't live your life with that burden. Oh my God. And, and then mess up your life. Express, and the last thing is, you know, Express your appreciation and gratitude, you know, for for that person or for that community or for that pers- personality. Hmm? That without him, the same thing. Describe what your life would be missing without their trust and their company. Yadi na hoy to kabi ki hoy to. What would be my life without Chaitanya Mahaprabhu? What would be? My, you know, I've done offense to you, but believe me, my friend, my life will be nothing without you. And it's a fact. Bhaktidit Maharaj said in the last few days of his life, all we have is each other. Right? That's the statement he made. Ultimately, all that we have is each other. So, I'm sorry, it has gone a little beyond time. So, you know, this is uh, something which is very important that this, uh, this aspect of seeking apology is such an important aspect of Vaishnava community because the fact is to err is human. We do commit mistakes. We do err in our relationships. 
with people you we do commit mistakes and that causes strain in the relationships and ultimately the most important thing in human behavior is relationship management we we could do all sort of time management stress management life management all sorts of management but if we can't do relationship management there is practically no spiritual life hmm? so the whole purpose of human behavior is relationship management and an important aspect of relationship management is apology management how you manage your apology how you manage i mean i'm not when when you say manage is not a mechanical thing but how you you program yourself genuinely to seek apology and that's exactly what indra is doing and all these things requires a genuine humble heart and the humble heart will be there to the extent you understand the glory of krishna and from mother and from, from lord indra you realize that if indra who is so great is surrendered to krishna how great is our dear lord krishna shri krishna chandra bhagwan ki shri mad bhagavatam ki shri govardhan lila ki tai gaur premanandi thank you very much hare krishna